Legacy Precious Metals is the company that I trust to give you good and patient counsel for investing in your retirement. The Biden administration has caused a financial crisis and they have no clue how to fix it. Oil prices have skyrocketed and when oil prices go up, not only do your expenses go up, but the cost of transportation and shipping spikes, leading the prices of goods to rise. And when and we are already seeing record inflation. That's the last thing that we need. Our economy is in trouble and you need to take steps to protect yourself. If all your money is tied up in stocks, bonds, and traditional markets, you may be vulnerable. So gold is one of the very best ways to protect your retirement. No matter what happens, you own your own gold. It's real, it's physical, and it's always been valuable since the dawn of time. Call Legacy Precious Metals today at 866-528-1903 or visit them online at LegacyPMInvestments.com. That's LegacyPMInvestments.com where you can download the free investor's guide. You can also go to my Facebook page, Jenna Ellis. I am a public figure on Facebook and I just posted yesterday a really great interview with the president of Legacy Precious Metals who is discussing why you need to start your retirement account even if you're in your your 20s or 30s. There is always a great time to protect your retirement and invest just like you want to protect your health over the long term. So go to Legacy Precious Metals at LegacyPMInvestments.com or call 866-528-1903. As a constitutional law attorney, former senior legal advisor and personal counsel to President Donald J. Trump, Jenna Ellis believes in the rule of law and the importance of integrity in our elections. And she's ready to tackle the big cultural and legal issues facing America. This is The Jenna Ellis Show. Here is your host, Jenna Ellis. Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of The Jenna Ellis Show. I'm Jenna Ellis, and I know that all of you have been so excited for this interview because here today we have the God King himself of Daily Wire. And of course, everyone knows and loves Daily Wire, all of the great personalities. And we've seen how Daily Wire has really just advanced in the streaming service and the entertainment industry. They have really gone behind this whole motto of go woke, go broke, because now they're actually streaming larger than and the Walt Disney Company. So how did this happen? Where are they going? So here to discuss is Jeremy Boring. And I really appreciate your time because, you know, you're sometimes on camera, but largely uh, in the background. So thanks for making time today. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So so talk first. Let's go kind of back in history about the inception of Daily Wire, because I know a lot of people have been following Ben Shapiro for a really long time. But how did you guys actually meet and have this whole concept of Daily Wire? Yeah, well, like everyone, uh, I met Ben at a coffee bean on Ventura Boulevard, which is basically Ben's de facto office for about a decade, I think. Uh, and we were introduced by Mark Masters, who, a good friend of both of us at the time, Ben was working for Mark at Talk Radio Network, which was uh, at that time the largest privately or the largest private syndicator of talk radio in the country. And I think Ben was Mark's GC. I met Ben by way of Andrew Breitbart. I believe Ben did as well. Um, I was introduced to Mark more on the feature entertainment side of things. You know, Mark was wanting to make some moves in that direction. So he put me in touch with his lawyer, Ben, and we, we sat down. And I think by the end of that very first coffee, Ben and I were already in business together on some project or another. We, we really hit it off quickly and, and immediately started trying to do work together. Some early video animation stuff, which in some ways was a precursor to the work that we did with uh, PragerU. Um, political commentary helping you know move Ben into doing talk radio, which is, of course, a precursor to the podcast work. After a few years, we started a, a project for the David Horowitz Freedom Center called Truth Revolt. And that really was sort of the proto-Daily Wire. I mean, that was the proving grounds for a lot of the ideas that have gone on to shape the Daily Wire. Yeah. And so a lot of people who have listened to Ben and of course, um, you know, he was kind of one of the front runners of the whole podcast industry. Um, was that intentional that you saw that space of podcasting and alternative media uh, really giving a voice beyond just terrestrial radio? Uh, yes and no. Yes, in that Ben was very forward thinking about podcasts right from the beginning. He had dipped his toe in podcasting by way of his Seattle-based talk radio show that he was doing at that time. He was doing six hours a day of AM talk radio when we first started The Daily Wire. And he had a podcast that had about 5,000 downloads. And it was just a 
repackage of the talk radio show, but it really opened up Ben's imagination to what might be possible in the podcasting space. No, from a sort of central business point of view. I mean, the very first day of The Daily Wire, we launched The Ben Shapiro Show. We shot the show alongside The Andrew Clavin Show in my pool house, behind my house uh, there in Sherman Oaks, California, um, in front of a black drape. You know, we blocked out the windows with black drapes and, and recorded and did video for both podcasts. So it was always, I mean, right there from day one, it was part of our business, but we had no idea from an economic point of view how much of a driver it would be of our business. You know, like I say, Ben, ben had a strong vision for it, and so we were right there from day one. But if you had told us at that time, you know, if Ben had 5,000 downloads at that time, his vision was that maybe one day he could have 50,000. You know, and instead he has almost a million and a half people every single day engaging with this podcast. We had no idea that was possible. Yeah, which is absolutely incredible. And I think a lot of people like myself included uh, first heard of Daily Wire and kind of came on board from more of the political space and yep. uh, the political commentary. But especially with Drew Clavin, who um, don't tell anyone, but he's actually my favorite um, because I've known him the longest and uh, he's great. In his he's Drew Clavin's favorite, too. Oh, well, then there you go. And, uh, and, and of course, we won't even talk about Michael Knowles. Um, you know, nobody likes him at all. But, uh, but Drew has taught me so much about the cultural and entertainment perspective. And that's mm. always been a huge piece of Daily Wire and your background as well as in Hollywood. So how does that fit into uh, the political commentary and this whole vision of what Daily Wire has become? Well, I think there's a, a very special moment that we got to be a part of uh, where West Coast conservatism really had outsized influence. You know, we used to joke that if somebody wanted to essentially cripple uh, the future of conservatism, they could have done so with like the Hiroshima bomb. Like a, a 12 kiloton blast radius would have contained every single conservative in Southern California. You had uh, us at various times sharing an office or only a block down the street from Prager U, which was a block down the street from the David Horowitz Freedom Center which was two blocks away from Dave Rubin's home, which was only a handful of blocks away from where uh, Joe Rogan was at the time and only a handful of blocks away from um, uh, the Friends of Abe office. I mean, just every single thing that was happening. Breitbart was over the hill in Santa Monica. That was the only outlier. But there really was this moment where Southern California conservatism was really ascendant. And I think that it brought some unique attributes to the to the national conversation, not least of all because we were all LA guys, right? We were all people who had either, like Ben, been born, or most of us had migrated to Southern California. We'd been drawn by the idea of culture, the idea of entertainment. And so that was on everyone's mind, you know, from, from Drew, I think probably at the four, only because he's about 300 years old. So he remembered when Hollywood was founded. He remembered, you know, when we had the first talkie, when they brought color to theaters. Uh, he knew he knew the power, though, of story in a really fundamental way. And and we all did. Like I say, I met Ben essentially discussing the possibility of a film deal. So it was it was always a part of not only our, our vision for what the Daily Wire could become, but it's just part of our DNA, I think, not just at the Daily Wire, but all of that West Coast conservatism to be creative, to be creating culture, not only commenting or criticizing culture. And because conservatism in a sort of definitional way, is reactionary uh, because the sort of constitutional makeup of a conservative uh, predisposes them to look backward and not forward, right? We, we like the best ideas of the past. We like the best ideas that tradition can bring to bear. And so conservatives sometimes forsake forward-looking, constructive, you know, cultural-type uh, ideas. And, and I think West Coast conservatism has challenged that. And even though we're not in California any longer, we're still we are still those guys, and we're still acting on those ideas that were incubated, you know, at at Friends of Abe, that were incubated in the earliest days of Breitbart, were incubated back when the David Horowitz Freedom Center was was essentially uh, devoted to art and entertainment. So, I, I really do think, just on a sort of fundamental DNA basis, that's who who Ben and I are, and and Drew and others. Yeah, and you can see that so clearly through uh, the Daily Wire's presentations and everything that you do. And how important do you think that is, especially to the up and coming next generation when, you know, you typically look at conferences and it's always just, you know, the guy at the podium who is criticizing something that Congress is doing. And it's sort of this boring kind of rhetoric rather than engaging in arts and culture and theater. And, you know, Andrew Breitbart was very famous for saying that politics is downstream from culture and culture I've added 
added to that phrase, if I could be so bold, to say that culture is downstream from worldview. And we've yeah. seen this evidenced uh, so clearly, even with Matt Walsh, and just this basic question of what is a woman that is very political in nature, but now has kind of blossomed into this cultural commentary and cultural criticism, but in a very quirky and almost humorous way. Well, obviously, I think it's incredibly important. I, we, we've sort of staked our entire careers and, and the, the future of our company on this idea that, as you say, Andrew sort of popularized this idea that politics is downstream from the culture. And, and I think it's absolutely right. You know, I, I always point out that in uh, 2008, Barack Obama could not win uh, the Democratic primary. He couldn't win as a Democrat running for president without opposing gay marriage. And just four years later in 2012, Barack Obama could not win as a Democrat for president if he opposed gay marriage. I mean, one of the one of the greatest, most fundamental shifts in a central idea, maybe in the history of the world, and driven almost entirely by Hollywood, driven almost entirely by entertainment media. Just the idea, I would actually challenge that even worldview is downstream of culture, that culture has more of an impact on how we see the world than how we see the world has an impact on our taste in culture. I think that that's evidenced by the enormous power of shows like Will and Grace. Whatever you think about you know, homosexuality or gay marriage, I mean, put the politics of it aside for a moment, just the impact, just measuring it on a sheer impact level. There's never been, I don't think, anything like it in human history. And, and what, what was Will and Grace? You know, what was that, that moment in the mid-2000s when, when the world changed its view on this issue so fundamentally in terms of not each individual, but certainly uh, the majority of people? And what it was was just entertaining. You know, Will and Grace wasn't a lecture fest. It went for laughs, not claps. It wasn't this modern leftist com uh, kind of comedy that doesn't aspire to be funny. It was a delightful, charming, wonderful show that everyone wanted to watch that happened to be changing the way that we saw something incredibly central to how we've ordered our society. You, there's never been a power like that, and especially in this mass communication age. The, the power to shape how people see the world um, is one that conservatives have forsaken at their own at their own peril. We, we have to get involved in the conversation where the conversation is actually happening. And that's not when people have their political hat on. It's not at the ballot box. It's happening when people get home from work, they're exhausted, and they sit down to be entertained. You know, that's, who, that's who gets to speak to their hearts, and that's ultimately then who gets to determine their values. Yeah. So why do you think it is that conservatives have abandoned mm. culture and the arts and we want these sort of lecture series and we leave entertainment to the Hollywood uh, really depraved uh, individuals and, and their minds? And, you know, I mean, Andrew Clavin probably has harsher words uh, for them than I do. Um, but just seeing shows even, you know, like I'll watch some of these shows like Grey's Anatomy, for example, to see what is the changing narrative? And even to go back to shows like The West Wing that were so famous and so beloved, you can now see how those scripts were laying the groundwork for what the Democrats and the leftists are arguing today. And if you go back to those moments in history, you can see it so clearly. And conservatives are, you're right, just failing at that. Why? Well, I think there's probably myriad reasons, but I'll, I'll focus in on two of them. One of them is fundamental. And because it's fundamental, there's not much you can do about it except be aware of it. And that's that art is a fundamentally liberal undertaking. I'm not saying liberal in the sense of the political left, but I am saying liberal in the sense that art is about expression, it's about freedom, it's about creation. Uh, it's not a fundamentally conservative undertaking. It's not about preserving. It's not about uh, looking back, right? It's, it's creative. Creative necessarily means pointed ahead. And so, on a, on a kind of fundamental level, liberals then are attracted to engage in this liberal activity. And in our day and age, liberals are all of what we consider in America now, what, what we would widely agree is the political left. Uh, I don't think that that part is necessarily always true, but it is always liberals who are going to create art. It's not, you know, Catholic priests don't create art. Now, the Catholic church uh, through patronage was responsible for the creation of a lot of art, but the art was created by artists, right? You needed the priests to actually do the conservative work of bringing people back into tradition, bringing people back into uh, the Bible and, and into church. And then the church needed to empower more liberal people who were going to 
lift people's eyes up, lift their eyes, you know, which by the way, Genesis says, lift up now thine eyes numerous times. Like God is creative. He created the heavens and the earth. So God has this sort of liberal, not leftist, but liberal peace. And then he's also the God uh, of, uh, you know, who, who roots us in reality and has brought forward uh, the Bible and all these traditions for us as well. So, you know, in, in that sort of dichotomy, sometimes in this moment in particular, we see politics breaking along the lines of that dichotomy. Now, when the church was the patron of those arts, the priest couldn't have created it, but the priest was empowering its creation. And in that tension between the way that the artist saw the world and the way that the, the funder of the art, the church saw the world, they were able to harness the power of the, the positive creative powers of lowercase liberalism to the sort of values end of the lowercase c traditionalist conservative worldview. And, that, and in that moment, a lot of amazing art was created that we would still as conservatives love and value even today. But that, that got out of whack uh, in the 20th century in particular. And the leftists began to run the liberals, right? The, the liberals became in service of the left instead of the liberals being in service of the right. And I think that that kind of is a fundamental understanding of what happened. But there is a second piece. And the second piece is less descriptive of just the way the world is. And it actually is more of a, uh, of a rebuke of those of us who are right of, uh, right of center. And that's that really in the, in the 80s in particular, there was a huge shift in mentality among conservative organizations toward the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And the nonprofit model was, had some efficacy for conservatives at that time. Because you could go to high net worth individuals around the country who were concerned because they could feel the ground shifting beneath their feet. Uh, and you could tell them, hey, take some of the money you made in your for-profit activities and give it to us to spend on things that may not have a direct profit implication. You know, let us do build some think tanks. Let us build some policy centers. Uh, let us start doing good. And conservatives were kind of familiar with that model anyway because it was sort of modeled on how the church works, right? The church does a lot of good that isn't necessarily for profit, and it does it by asking people to give uh, this sort of what, what we would consider like a charitable tithe or some of a charitable donation to the church. So it was a framework that conservatives could really relate to. The problem is, over time, that conservative mentality, and this isn't a repudiation of any particular conservative nonprofit. There are some great ones. PragerU, we already mentioned, I think is one of the great nonprofits in the country. But this nonprofit mentality began to shift the way that conservatives see the world because it divorced any need for success in mm -hmm. terms of practical success from financial success. In fact, in some ways, it put those two things at odds. You could suddenly win by losing. If something went really bad for conservatives in the culture, if something went really bad for conservatives politically, you could fundraise off of that in your nonprofit. You could take that despair that the audience felt, that the, that the citizens felt. You could take that fear that citizens felt and get them to pony up another donation. But you never had to actually win to continue getting those donations. And in a, and in a kind of unintended sense, it wouldn't necessarily even be good for you to win on any of the issues that the nonprofit fights for. Now, again, I'm not repudiating the idea of a nonprofit. But when this became the dominant mentality on the right, the dominant way that we sought to advance our worldview, we were saying by our own standard that we were going to lose. In other words, when the people who purport to believe in the power of free enterprise, the power of market economics, almost exclusively use charity to promulgate their worldview, they are saying by their own standard that they have chosen the losing methodology. And when the left, by contrast, who purport to hate market economics and free market uh, incentives, exclusively use the market to promulgate their worldview through the music industry, through Hollywood, through big business now, they've definitionally chosen the winning, the efficient methodology. And so we, the, the people who previously believed in market forces, who, who made a bunch of money in the markets in the second half of the 20th century, began shifting how we thought about doing good in the world. And it, it had another third sort of incendiary effect too, which is we suddenly, even on our side, began to think of making money as not good, but using that money in charitable ways after you made it was good. And I think the second we decided that we lost any ability to impact culture, 
We lost any ability to create novel and new things that could do good. We began to apologize for the successes that we have in the parts of our lives that we do spend in the market. You know, this is when oil companies suddenly start running multi-million dollar ad campaigns for green energy. Why are they doing that? Because they're apologizing for what for what I actually believe is a fundamental good, which is that they they created economic forces, they em, em, uh, employed and empowered people, provided healthcare for people. Now they're apologizing for that. And at that very moment, then you're saying, if success is something we have to apologize for, and charity is the only thing that we can feel good about, then in every way, we've just handicapped our ability to build the future. And art is fundamentally about building the future. Entertainment is fundamentally about building the future. I think the Daily Wire is fundamentally about building the future. We are not trying to preserve the past. If conservative means I want everything to be 1950, the Daily Wire is not conservative. I do not want to live in 1950. You know, black people didn't have it very good in 1950, just for one example. Now, was there a lot in 1950? I'm really glad that we amended the Constitution so I can vote. You know, we're, we're continuing to create a more perfect union. That's right. What I believe is that we should take the best, the things that were great about 1950, and let's build a better future on those things. That's why, you know, I, I'm not a radical. I don't want to throw out the traditions of the past. I'm not a leftist. I don't want to throw out all the traditions of the past and build a utopianist future that's never been tested. I want to, but I do want to build a future rooted in the best ideas of the past. And that that is going to be challenging for conservatives. We have to challenge this nonprofit mentality. We have to, to challenge this always looking backward point of view. We have to challenge ourselves to look ahead with some optimism and build something new. Yeah, and that's so well said, Jeremy, because conservatives often, because we do talk about the principles of the past and our founding and our heritage, and we're steeped in traditions and roots of the history and all of that, we do tend to look backwards and we say that conservatism means conserving our principles and conserving our values, but we fail sometimes and oftentimes to apply them into a new uh, era, and especially yeah. when it comes to things like technology and uh, communications and these things that the founders couldn't have possibly contemplated exactly what technology we would be using in the 21st century. Uh, but they did have the fundamental principle that we should all be free to speak our beliefs and have this free marketplace of ideas, free yeah. from government restraint or government compelling us to speak against our sincerely held religious beliefs. And so we can take the principle, but apply it to the future and to continue mm. to build on history and tradition. And so I think you're absolutely right about the nonprofit view and how that has really handicapped us in a lot of ways. But I also wonder, do you think that this philosophy as you're talking about, um, if the greater good is philanthropy and giving and capitalism bad? I mean, I see so many people who tweet at me, oh, you're just a grifter. Well, yeah. you know, we all have to make a living. And so how how is somehow engaging in the work that I do as an attorney, as you know, a political commentator on campaigns, somehow to the left even, that's now just grifting. And you guys see that in your criticism as well. And so how has the left kind of harnessed that in this sort of woke ESG corporate climate that mm -hmm. now when you see these big companies that all they're doing uh, to the public face is look at everything that we're giving and the ways we're being humanitarian, the ways we're being woke, like, for example, the Walt Disney Company. Yeah, uh, that's great. I, I really think that this is the whole fight that no one is actually talking about, but is the defining fight of our time. You know, government obviously is this enormous threat to our freedoms, and the Constitution was meant to, to restrain the power of government to, to infringe upon our freedoms. But right now, today, I actually think that the biggest threat to Americans is from corporations. And historically, that's been a very left-wing way of viewing the world. And I want to be careful to say that I'm not suggesting that what we need is for the government to come in and break the corporations or even to regulate the corporations toward some end. You know, there are a lot of people on the right, it's pretty in vogue to say that the government should get involved and really wrestle these corporations into submission. Uh, I don't like that idea on a on a philosophical level because I believe in freedom, but I also don't like it in a very practical level just because I don't believe that we have or are likely to have anytime soon the kind of consensus uh, that would be required to even engage in that kind of behavior. I think those tools would be used against us far more than they're used for us uh, once unleashed. I think it's simpler than that. I think that in order to have a free country, 
you have to have broad neutrality, not total neutrality, but broad neutrality in the sort of intervening institutions. And the intervening institutions are things like corporations, right? News media, entertainment media, music, but all the way down to banks and credit cards and uh, you know people who make your razor. Historically, those companies have always, now many of them might've been peopled or populated with people of the left. Hollywood, great example, music industry, great example. But they've always taken a broadly neutral, not totally neutral, but a broadly neutral approach to how they interact with their consumer base. And that's because corporations are inherently risk averse. They want, they exist to maximize profitability and you don't maximize profitability in normal times by alienating potential customers. But something really unique happened during the Barack Obama administration. Barack Obama said to corporations, he said to uh, comedians, he said to musicians, he said to journalists, journalists, it's no longer about speaking truth to power, holding powerful accountable. It, he said to comedians, it, it's no longer about critiquing uh, the powerful and getting a laugh at the behalf of the powerful. It's about changing the world affirmatively into a more left-wing utopianist view of what it could be. And by virtue of, of the unique role that Barack Obama played in our history, he was able for essentially eight years to change the way that all these organizations function, to make of them activists. And then when Donald Trump's elected president for four years, and literally in the view of these organizations, literally Hitler becomes the president of the United States, well, that only justified doubling down on that sort of Obama view that, that the inter, what had historically been neutral intervening or inter, intermediary institutions should go all in for activism. They made another assessment too, which is that since, since they owned every institution, conservatives really couldn't do anything about them becoming activist. I mean, you still want to watch TV at night. You still want to take a credit card and pay for your lunch with it. You still have to shave your, your beard or your legs. Uh, so you're going to have to buy a razor. In other words, you still have to buy their product no matter how poorly they treat you. Conversely, they concluded that if they ran afoul of the Twitter mob or the Snap mob or the Insta mob uh, or their woke millennial employees and post-millennial employees, that they really could lose something because the left was so mobilized around this idea of activism. And so this is how you have Harry's razors dropping their, uh, their business with the Daily Wire because a Twitter account with two followers <laughs> criticized them for doing business with us. They wow. concluded, and, and I have to say, I don't think wrongly based on history. They concluded that it would be worse for them to upset the left winger with two followers on Twitter than it would be to upset a company with whom they'd been doing business for years with 60 million monthly users. Because the 60 million monthly users just don't have any alternatives. And in that world, where all the institutions became activists on the left, where all the risk was perceived to be from offending the left, all those institutions, which used to kind of keep a neutral, a neutral marketplace in which we could all operate, became weaponized against us. And so, yes, what I think we're doing at The Daily Wire is challenging that assumption. We're creating alternatives. Our alternatives don't have to be, we don't have to be as big as Disney. Jeremy's Razors doesn't have to be as big as Harry's Razors. We just have to say to conservatives, they bifurcated the culture. We can, by God, bifurcate the economy and make them pay a price. And what we want, do we want to make money? You bet we want to make money. We want to make a lot of money. Do we want to uh, grow a successful business? You bet we do. But what I really want is for Disney to move back to being a largely neutral actor in the marketplace because they have the greatest IP content library ever conceived in all of human history. I want my daughter to be able to go to Disneyland. I want all of us to be able to benefit from that beautiful content that they've made over the last century. Today, we can't. But if we create alternatives and allow conservatives to be able to say no with their, with their pocketbook, I think that we can actually shift those institutions back to being broadly centrist. And I think if the institutions are centrist, now we're back in the marketplace of ideas. Now, mm -hmm. the things you believe, the things I believe, the things that unite us can actually win out. Whereas right now, they're so suppressed, it's incredibly hard for them to. Yeah, and it sounds like the the way to reshift that balance and to come back to a better marketplace of ideas and to have these institutions uh, become more in the lane of of moderates and to not uh, be so extreme is to do more 
capitalism rather than doing more politics, because it seems right. like there's a lot of uh, conservatives, very well-meaning, uh, but people like, for example, at the Claremont Institute that love to say the solution then is more government winning. And they would be the ones that are championing uh, Republicans to then harness all power of government and try to then just put squish their thumb over these woke corporations, which I think is a disastrous idea, yeah. because if you have a Republican in a state like Florida uh, doing that to a corporation like Disney, and I was obviously very outspoken on that issue saying, you know, I don't care what you think about the Walt Disney Company. I absolutely disagreed with their criticism of Florida's parental rights and education education bill. But what I don't agree with is then Florida going one step further and punishing mm -hmm. Disney for expressing a constitutionally protected right to freedom of speech. And that type of principle to say, if we are championing Republicans doing that in those circumstances, you better bet the left is going to do that they're already doing it and they're going to continue to take it further. So all we'll see is a continued bifurcation of yep. these ideas. We'll have massive differences and distinctions, even more than we already do, between red and blue states. And then we're losing our moral high ground to say no limited government is best so that options in the free marketplaces and businesses and the economy and capitalism can truly thrive. Because if we come back to looking at the past, but applying uh, these concepts to the future, we we want to make sure that government on all sides, regardless of partisan politics or what letter is after a certain governor's name, we want to make sure that it's so limited that everyone can thrive and then we can go into the marketplace and we can beat them at their own game and we can win in all of the ways that you're suggesting. Yeah, I mean, you and I are largely aligned, I think, on what happened in Florida. I will say I'm only going to get so bent out of shape about it. I do to quote a great man, you know, I do believe in punching back twice as hard. Uh, and to some extent, I understand why conservatives were very happy with what Governor DeSantis did. Mm -hmm. I don't like what Governor DeSantis did, mostly because of how he framed his justification for it, which was to say, essentially, if you're going to exercise free speech in Florida, we're going we're gonna to punish you. I'm broadly very supportive of Governor DeSantis. I thought that that was a misstep on his part. He could have taken the exact same action uh, and framed it somewhat differently, and I probably would have felt differently about it. Never, nevertheless, you and I, you and I largely, uh, I think, agree with what happened there. What, what I think part of the problem, though, that you're, uh, that you're framing is, comes back to this nonprofit problem. Because for 40 plus years, conservative thought leaders have largely been paid for their thoughts by nonprofits. Some, not, some of them I like. I think Claremont's done a lot of good in the world. I think Heritage has done a lot of good in the world. Uh, there, there are others. But because all of the conservative thinkers, by and large, for, for at least a generation now, have been able to operate in a sort of academic world removed from actual practical cause and effect, the market, that has caused them to have wrong opinions about how the market does and should work. They don't know. The market is just it's like talking to any college professor who lives a life sort of largely immunized from dealing with those practical realities. All of their thoughts about the market are, are hypothetical. All of them are abstract. And on the other hand, almost all they think about all day long is government. And listen, they're in the fight. The left is attacking them just like they attack you and me, right? They're getting banned from all the same places that we're getting banned for. They're facing all the same challenges, which can be very radicalizing. And so I think over time, if all you think about is we're under attack and all I think about are policy-based, government-based solutions, and I don't really understand, I'm disconnected from how market economics work because that's not how I get my paycheck. That's not how the people who pay me get their paychecks. Then you do wind up in this world where I think conservatives in this exact moment in history can have some bad ideas about policy, have bad ideas about the relationship between the state and corporations, and can have bad ideas about corporations more broadly. I think, it's funny, we, I'm, I don't think about policy as the fundamental place to solve any of our problems, although certainly policy is an important, has an important role to play. But I really think if you can change all the incentives, we have misaligned incentives on the right. We, we have to get rid of this nonprofit mentality because we are just incentivized to be wrong on some issues. Uh, again, there's a role for nonprofits. 
they should not be driving, nonprofits should not be driving the conversation on the right. Mm-hmm. Well, and Daily Wire is doing an absolutely phenomenal job of driving the conversation uh, from a business standpoint and from someone who's a participant in the free market and who's actually making an impact. I mean, looking at how often all of your uh, personalities and, and the people who are speaking to culture are trending on Twitter on uh, what you know sh- maybe should historically just be traditional politics politics and political topics, it's all this blend of culture and it's these questions that are really, truly fascinating. And so as we're looking forward then, and as you're looking to uh, to build a more perfect union and to kind of bring uh, corporations away from this kind of nonprofit mentality, what does the future look like for Daily Wire? And hmm. what are the, the things and the places that uh, you anticipate going in the next few years? Well, the first thing I would say is Daily Profit, uh, Daily Wire is incredibly optimistic. And I said daily profit, I wanna be clear. I'm not ashamed to say that we're pursuing profit. Uh, I don't believe that there should be tension between our ideological mission, which is to build a future for Western civilization, and our corporate mission, which is to make money. Those two things, I don't think they're at odds with each other. In fact, I think that they are and should be more and more in complete alignment with one another. I I am a absolute proponent of the market. Um, The Daily Wire is optimistic. In some sense, because we're realistic. We don't think that we're trying to save America. We lost America. And in most real ways, the culture that conservatives spent the last 40 years trying to preserve is no longer the dominant culture in the country. And that's tragic. If, If I allowed myself to, I could probably curl up in a ball and just mourn that for the rest of my life. But to what end? Instead, I see it as an unbelievable opportunity. The left's belly is so soft. Their jaw is glass. They've been ascendant for my entire life in the culture. They have not had to defend their ground at all because conservatives have not challenged them for that ground at all. And so right now, sort of at the end of all things, is also the beginning of whatever is going to be. And we are so well, not just the Daily Wire, we, as the, the, the West, we, we, the champions of what the West has been, we, the American conservative, have never had a greater opportunity to defeat, in our generation, the left, in terms of creating the future, creating the culture that we all desire to have. Not going backward, going forward. Uh, because again, they won, and, and it's, like the, it's like the Christopher Nolan Batman movie, right? Like, victory has made them weak. That's where they are. Victory has made them weak, and now is a great time for a bunch of rebels like us to go challenge their primacy. And in some ways, that's the cycle of history. Victory had made us weak in the 1960s, and the left exploited that weakness, and a ragtag bunch of rebels kind of overthrew us for cultural primacy. Now we're at the other side of that pendulum swing, and if we can stop looking backwards, if we can stop spending our lives just lamenting, and instead be optimists, lift up our eyes, get engaged in the act of creation, be fruitful and multiply, all those things that make Genesis so special, this is the Genesis of whatever is to come, and we can go build it. That's what The Daily Wire is going to do. And so well said. And you know, going back to Genesis, God is a creator God, and he also has designed us to be industrious and creative like him. And you know, work came even in uh, the Garden of Eden and before the fall mm-hmm. in the creation story, work is a good thing. And so for people who want to sit back and just say, well, this sort of uh, culture where we don't have to actually advance and we do just right. sit back and sort of lament uh, just the last couple of decades, we are failing to take into account this great history that we've been given, but also failing to look at what the champions of the past did in order to pursue a more perfect union. Because if our founders had just sat back and said, oh, well, freedom is gone. Religious freedom. We'll never have it back again. Look at, you know, what the Church of England has done. We would have never had this country to begin with. And so okay. you're absolutely right. We need to stop just lamenting and start engaging and looking forward. And the Daily Wire has been uh, just an exceptional ground for uh, advancement of 
all of the good things and all of the good ideas and the way to analyze things. I love uh, listening to everyone on uh, on your broadcast and, you know, have um, been very honored to come and, and actually share uh, the airwaves with, with some of your hosts and always love visiting you in Nashville. And um, so just in the last few minutes I have with you, Jeremy, um, so you know, as you're looking at at the future, what would be your challenge to um, the young person or, you know, the millennial, the Gen Zer who listens to Daily Wire, who loves all of this content and is sitting back and thinking, well, you know, I'm not yet the head of a, you know, <laughs> of a major corporation. How do I get engaged and how do yeah. I help build the future like this? Because I'm so inspired now by what you're saying. Yeah, that's a great question. Listen, uh, until my 32nd birthday, I don't think I'd ever made $40,000 in a year. Uh, my, my life was one of taking huge risks and failing many, many times. And that's the privilege, I think, of being an American, is that we, we live in a society where you can go out and try and you can fail and you can learn and you can try again. So go do that. Don't hold yourself to some sort of impossible standard that says the first thing that you try has to work. And the other thing I would say to young people is just know that wealth, power, and fame are the three most corrosive uh, elements for a human being. And to the extent that you want to engage in politics or culture or media or business, you're wanting to wield some percentage of those. And to the extent that you want to do that, sort of for the for the sake of things that you believe are good, I'm not going to tell you not to do that by any means. I do it. But you should remember that Moses didn't get to inherit the land of promise and David didn't get to build the temple. Uh, there, There is a price to be paid for waging uh, this, for, for wielding influence. And uh, one should go into that with their eyes wide open, and they should hold themselves to the standard uh, of grace and not to some sort of exacting standard of perfection. And the third thing that I would say is challenge. You know, your your advice. You, you ask for advice for young conservatives. I would encourage young conservatives to challenge older conservatives, because older conservatives are continuing to reinforce this nonprofit mentality, and they need to stop. You know, if if I have one more conservative donor type tell ask me. When are we going to have a, a conservative Facebook or a conservative Twitter? I'd be a millionaire if you know, I just got a dollar every time one of these guys met. The problem is you can't have a conservative Twitter and you can't have a conservative Facebook because you would have never, ever, if a, if a 22-year-old guy with a backpack and sneakers had walked into the family office of some rich Dallas energy uh, billionaire and said, hey, you know, I designed this app that lets me rank how hot girls are on my campus. But I think if I had some funding, I could turn it into the most important communication medium ever conceived in all of human history. They'd call security on him. And then 20 years later, they would say, why don't we have a Facebook? You know what? We probably will have a conservative Facebook. Now that that technology is 20 years old, we'll probably have one and it'll be worthless. And everybody will have moved on to the next thing that the conservative donor class would have never allowed themselves to fund because they are looking always backward. You, we have to stop looking backwards. We have to believe in the future. We have to be optimists. We have to go build something that doesn't yet exist. If we don't do that, we're going to keep losing and we're going to deserve to keep losing. Hmm. So well said. Well, everyone should subscribe to Daily Wire. Continue to support uh, everything that you do to get all of this great content and anything else that uh, anywhere that anyone can find you. And uh, also talk about your razor company as well and how people can uh, can support that and, and buy those yeah. because, hey, there's now options. And that's a that's great right. thing. That's right. We're creating those alternatives. You can get all dailywireplus.com. Get all of our great content. We're making movies. We're making kids content. We're making great political content. I hate Harry's.com. You can buy your Jeremy's razors. That's our way of fighting back against Harry's in this ad cancel culture is to say, what, what if you didn't have to buy the products of people who have concluded that they don't work for you, have concluded that your ideas are bad and uh, that you're irredeemable? The answer is go buy something from someone who doesn't believe that about you. So that's just two of the ways that we're, do that we're engaging in the fight at the Daily Wire. And we're very grateful to everybody. Uh, who joins us in that fight. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Jeremy. It's been a pleasure and an honor. And um, I love The Daily Wire and will continue to uh, help in the ways that I can to uh, to support this and advance the the true cultural fight, which is, um, as you mentioned and, and articulated so well, moving forward instead of just looking backwards. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Jenna.
Legacy Precious Metals is the company that I trust to give you good and patient counsel for investing in your retirement. The Biden administration has caused a financial crisis and they have no clue how to fix it. Oil prices have skyrocketed and when oil prices go up, not only do your expenses go up, but the cost of transportation and shipping spikes, leading the prices of goods to rise. And when and we are already seeing record inflation. That's the last thing that we need. Our economy is in trouble and you need to take steps to protect yourself. If all your money is tied up in stocks, bonds, and traditional markets, you may be vulnerable. So gold is one of the very best ways to protect your retirement. No matter what happens, you own your own gold. It's real, it's physical, and it's always been valuable since the dawn of time. Call Legacy Precious Metals today at 866-528-1903 or visit them online at LegacyPMInvestments.com. That's LegacyPMInvestments.com where you can download the free investor's guide. You can also go to my Facebook page, Jenna Ellis. I am a public figure on Facebook and I just posted yesterday a really great interview with the president of Legacy Precious Metals who is discussing why you need to start your retirement account even if you're in your your 20s or 30s. There is always a great time to protect your retirement and invest just like you want to protect your health over the long term. So go to Legacy Precious Metals at LegacyPMInvestments.com or call 866-528-1903. MyPillow is having their biggest sheet sale of the year. You all have helped build MyPillow into the amazing company that it is today. Now Mike Lindell, the inventor and CEO, wants to give back exclusively to you, his listeners. The Percale bed sheet set is available in a variety of colors and sizes, and they are all on sale. So for example, the queen size is regularly priced at $89.99 but is now only $39.98 with our listener promo code Jenna, J-E-N-N-A. So order now because when they're gone, they're gone. The Percale bed sheets are breathable and have a cool and crisp feel. These come with a 10-year warranty and a 60-day money-back guarantee, so don't miss out on this incredible offer. There's a limited supply, so be sure to order now. You can call one 800 564 8475 and use the promo code Jenna or go to mypillow.com forward slash Jenna. You can click on the radio listener square and use the promo code Jenna. That's J E N N A. Thank you so much to all of Mike Lindell's listeners and listeners of this podcast for making sure to support MyPillow and using our exclusive listener promo code Jenna. That's J E N N A. <laughs> 